Good morning. Hello? Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Well, I don't know how to turn it loud. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes. I can. Back there, you can hear me? Okay. <laughs> anyway, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome, and welcome to Marlboro, and welcome back to in person. Um, we're, I'm very excited and happy that everybody is, we're all here today. Um, and I can sense everybody here is happy to be here. The buzz in the room is delightful and yummy. It's great. Um, <clears throat> we weren't sure what the appetite would be for an in-person conference, but clearly there was one. So thank you all for being here. Um, our conference today is titled uh, Making a Cultural Commitment, Bridging the Cultural and Linguistic Gaps. Um, this conference was initially uh, planned for the spring of 2020, um, but the pandemic obviously got in our way. Um, but this idea and the concept and the theme is even more relevant today. So um, it's two and a half years later. So I want to go through the goals for the day. Our, what, the first goal is really to enhance the capacity and skills of DDS and our providers in providing culturally responsive family supports that honor the beliefs and cultural practices of, of the diverse individuals and families that we serve. Our second goal is to create opportunities for sharing and learning about the development of community partnerships and networks supporting diverse communities. And our third goal today is to offer tools and strategies to conduct an organizational self-assessment of current services and community engagement and satisfaction. Um, I ha we do have a great day planned. I'm going to go through just a few housekeeping items and we'll get on with our program. So. <clears throat> The schedule is in your packet with um, <clears throat> the locations of all the workshops and the times, but we do have a little change. So the interpretation and cultural considerations will be in the princess room, not the sterling, and on a cultural journey, listening and learning from our peers in family support centers will be in the sterling uh, room. All of the workshops are in the foyer through those doors except for the sterling room which is you have to go through the hotel lobby past where we registered. There's double doors there, and it's to the left. So that's the Sterling Room. Um, all the uh, rooms should be labeled with the workshop titles. So you should be able to find them. The restrooms are in the foyer. Um, there's additional restrooms, again, through the um, hotel lobby past the registration on your right. So there's restrooms there. Um, so before we move on to our family welcome, I'd like to um, thank and recognize the conference planning group. So they're just going to stand and wave. Um, so I'll start with Lily Rosden from Multicultural Community Center. <laughs> Judy Santamaria from Communitas. <laughs> Kelly Eau Claire from um, the Department of Developmental Services. <laughs> Isabel Castro from Multicultural Community Services. Kristen Omelia from DDS. Jess Gonzalez from the Plymouth County Family Support Center. Judy Doherty, who's from DDS. Carrie Mahoney, who's from the Ark of Massachusetts, isn't able to join us today. She's done a lot of the details for this whole day, and she's celebrating a milestone anniversary, and she's in Maine. <laughs> so we have Brianna Dickerson from Multicultural Community Services. Andy Law from Project ABLE, a program of advocates. Kristen DeAndrea from Riverside Community Care. Maria Stefano from DDS. We have Kathleen Amaral from um, the Ark of Massachusetts. And Beth Doyle from DDS. So we met several times over many, many months, and I just want to thank all of you. We pulled it off. Well, we hope we pulled it off. We're only at the beginning. <laughs> So uh, now I would like to introduce um, Jaya Pandey, who has graciously accepted our ask for a family welcome. Kritagya hume, kritagya hume, jese asman ki kritagya hai prithvi. Jese prithvi ka kritagya hai kisan. जैसे सागर का कृतज्ञ है बादल जैसे नए जीवन के लिए बादल का आभारी है नन्ना बिरवा कृतज्ञ हूं मैं धन्यवाद मैं जया पांडे 
आज की कॉन्फ्रेंस में आप सबका अभिनंदन करती हूँ स्वागत करती हूँ मेरा सौभाग्य है कि आज मुझे आपके सामने आपको इन पर्सन धन्यवाद देने का मौका मिला है मैं अपने पति आशीष और दो बेटों के साथ अजय एंड आनंद दे आर ट्वेंटी फाइव एंड ट्वेंटी थ्री फ्रेंकलिन में रहती हूँ इंडिया में पली बड़ी हूँ और हिंदी बोलती हूँ शादी के बाद पति के करियर के लिए घर परिवार मित्र नौकरी सब कुछ जो मेरा जाना पहचाना था सब छोड़ा और सात समंदर पार हम कहीं बाहर आए एक अच्छे भविष्य की उम्मीद में अमेरिकन ड्रीम्स को जीने के लिए वो मेरे दिन जीवन के बहुत अच्छे दिन थे उसके बाद हमारी नई पहली भरी रास्ता शुरू हुआ आनंद जब प्री स्कूल में था तो उसकी प्री स्कूल टीचर ने कहा कि हमको उसका इवैल्यूएशन कराना चाहिए आनंद अपने दोस्तों के साथ नहीं खेलता है और कॉम्प्रिहेंशन इज इन जनरल उसकी परेशानी है उस वो मेरे जीवन का बहुत महत्वपूर्ण क्षण है क्योंकि किसी और ने मेरा हाथ पकड़ा और दिशा दिखाई इट वॉज नॉट द मदर इन मी इट वॉज द टीचर धन्यवाद टीचर्स सपोर्ट स्टाफ नर्सेस दोस्त पड़ोसी डॉक्टर्स ऑफिस स्टाफ पी टी ओ टी एंड स्पीच पैथोलॉजिस्ट केस कोऑर्डिनेटर इन केस वर्कर सब ने मदद की सब ने अपने तरीके से मदद की लेकिन कहीं तो कुछ कमी थी हम उनके काम करने के तरीकों को और वो हमारे कल्चर को नहीं समझ पाते थे कई सालों के बाद कई सालों तक ये सब सोचने के बाद मैंने ऐसे मन में बहुत सवाल आते थे कि इस अकेलापन निराशा नाउमीदी को कैसे सुधारा जाए सब कुछ जीने के बाद मैंने ये सोचा कि किसी और को ये परेशानी नहीं होनी चाहिए और उसी कल्चरल गैप की कमी को पूरा करने के लिए 2017 में देसी माम्स नेटवर्क बना आज 255 इंडियन वुमेंस इन मैसेचुसेट्स एक दूसरे का सहारा है सपोर्ट सिस्टम है स्पेशल नीड फैमिलीज इमिग्रेंट फैमिलीज अकेली हैं घर वालों से बहुत दूर हैं जब आप उन्हें सपोर्ट करते हैं तो प्लीज कल्चरल क्यूरियासिटी के साथ जाइए ओपननेस के साथ जाइए उन फैमिलीज का आपके अलावा कोई नहीं है ये हमेशा याद रखिए अगर वो सर ढांकते हैं तो ऑर्थोडॉक्स नहीं है अगर वो डिजाइनर कपड़े नहीं पहनते हैं तो अनपढ़ नहीं है हाथ से खाना खाते हैं तो पुरातन पंथी नहीं है अगर ब्रोकन या एक्सेंट वाली इंग्लिश में बात करते हैं मतलब वो अनएजुकेटेड नहीं है घर में जूते पहनते हैं बैकवर्ड नहीं है मीट नहीं खाते हैं गरीब नहीं है आपसे बहुत सारे पर्सनल सवाल पूछते हैं नोजी नहीं है वो सिर्फ आपसे कनेक्शन बनाना चाहते हैं आपको घर में खाना टी और कॉफी ऑफर करते हैं क्योंकि ऐसा ही उन्होंने देखा है ये इंडिया का कल्चर है मैं समझती हूं कि आपका काम बहुत मुश्किल है बहुत मुश्किल है लेकिन आप उनकी उम्मीद हैं आशाएं हैं उनकी दुआ है और उनका सहारा है इन फैमिलीज की लाइफस्टाइल, रहन सहन बर्ताव खाना और भाषा आपसे अलग हो सकता है लेकिन इनकी जिंदगी का मकसद एक ही है उनके बच्चों की खुशहाल जिंदगी इस तरह से सारी दुनिया के माँ बाप का एक ही धर्म होता है उनके ही बच्चे उनका कल्चर रिलीजन सब कुछ हैं आज मैं आपसे निवेदन करती हूँ कि बस एक बात याद रखिए कि ये बच्चे आपके लिए सिर्फ एक क्लाइंट हैं लेकिन उन पेरेंट्स के लिए ये सब कुछ हैं अगर आप ऐसी फैमिली से मिलते हैं जो एक सी भाषा बोलते हैं जो एक जगह से हैं तो प्लीज उन्हें एक दूसरे से जोड़िए उनके विलेज को बनाने में उनकी मदद करिए मैं डीडीएस की शुक्रगुजार हूं इस महत्वपूर्ण थीम के लिए आप सब की यहां होने के लिए और उम्मीद करती हूं कि हम और आप 
आज एक दूसरे से बहुत कुछ सीखेंगे और उस दुनिया को बेहतर बनाएंगे शुभम करोती कल्याणम Thank you, Jaya. Um, now I'd like to welcome Commissioner Ryder to share some um, remarks with you. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank Ellen Kelly Carson, our statewide director of family support and our four regional family support directors, uh, Kristen O'Melia, Ingrid Flory, Shani Hubley, Shannon Hubley, and Rebecca Anderson. Um, I also want to thank Carrie Mahoney, who I hope is having a wonderful time in Maine, but all for, also for her help and Mass Arc's help in organizing this conference today. I would also like to thank our Family Support Council for their invaluable input and counsel throughout the year. And Jaya, thank you so much for your remarks this morning. This was a great way to, uh, to start this event. It is so great to be back in person, I have to tell you. Um, just being able to hear speakers today, see old friends, meet new colleagues, just talk about your work and yourselves is so important to the work all of you do. In reflecting upon the theme of today's conference, Making a Cultural connection, Commitment, I'd like to share with you my thoughts regarding the importance of listening and the importance of willing to try new things and how listening to individuals and families, as well as being creative and innovative, are constants in our work, our work of the past, our work in the present, and our work in the future. The recent past, of course, is defined by the pandemic. I will never forget what all the individuals and families we support experienced during the past two, two and a half years. The stoppage of services, the isolation, the unknown, the sickness, and the loss of life. And I cannot thank enough the DDS staff, the staff of all of our family support centers, everything all of you did to maintain connection with our families and individuals during this very difficult time. Reaching out to individuals and families and providing resources and supports was part of a response that no one could have been prepared for. And we will never forget how the pandemic further highlighted the great inequities that exist for access to services in healthcare in our minority communities across the Commonwealth. But something else happened during the pandemic. We heard from families and individuals. They came to us with ideas, different ways that we could support their loved ones, different ways of supporting people outside the traditional type of DDS services. Today, when I look at our present service system, unfortunately, we are not back. We have not fully recovered from the pandemic. Many individuals um, have yet to return to their day programs. Um, services are not back to full capacity. And not only day programs not being back at full capacity, our transportation system, of course, continues to have many challenges, and our residential system um, is stalled at the moment. We are experiencing a workforce crisis that we have never, ever experienced before. We do not have enough people to staff not only our current programs, but to even think about expanding services. So what is DDS doing today? Based upon the experience of the past two years, working to continue to support individuals and families 
through this extremely stressful time. We are continuing to work with our providers to support them in building back services. In the past two years, we have provided our providers with over $430 million to enhance the rates to, to our residential programs, to our day programs, and to our family support systems. Secondly, we at DDS are making a, collect a collective effort to update all of our active individuals' race and preferred language information in our database that contains the information on the over 40,000 individuals that we support. Currently, <laughs> currently, only about one third of our individuals have a race identified. As we want to ensure services and program decisions are equitable, I'm sure you would agree that this demographic information is so important to collect and to do in a standardized way. Thirdly, we are committed to diversity, inclusion, and equity for our staff and the individuals we support. We have diversity committees in each of our four regions and central office that identify in initiatives and resources we can present to our entire community to promote an environment that is culturally aware and welcoming. Fourth, we are continuing our technology forward initiative that has developed recommendations based on the feedback from among others, the ARC, many of our providers, individuals, families, and providers that include strategies to support individuals to be more self-reliant and promote independence. This, this summer, Massachusetts became only the third state in the country to be granted an HCBS waiver from CMS to ensure federal reimbursement for these important new technology services. Fifth, based on the feedback from families, we are developing alternative service models. Everything from alternative residential models, residential models that don't rely on 24-7 staffing in the traditional type group home. We are looking at different ways of providing day services, for example, our CBDS program without walls. And we're continuing to strengthen our self-direction program. So what does the future hold? The good news is our fiscal year 23 budget, which actually began July 1st, for DDS is a very, very robust budget, I would say. We are now funded at $2.44 billion, which is an increase of 7% from last fiscal year. Just a few of the highlights of this budget. For our community and day work programs, the um, account has been increased by over $58 million, which is a 27% increase. Our transportation has gone up, our uh, appropriation has gone up 25%. Our supportive technology line item, which we just introduced um, two years ago in the budget, is now funded at $1.75 million, which is a 250% increase um, from last year. Our family support line item has been increased by $5.8 million, which is a 7% increase, which is fantastic. Our adult autism ser services has gone up by 16%, which is fantastic. And we've seen another increase in our turning 22 line items. So as you can see, all positive developments on the budget front. There's also been an influx of federal money through the American, the, um, the American Recovery Plan, fondly known as APA, or those of us from Worcester call it APA. Um, <laughs> this federal money we're very excited about. We are going to des designate it for many initiatives that many families and individuals have come to us 
to really start developing, namely a lot in respite services. So ARPA money is going to be used for developing more of our medical respite facilities, school vacation program, drop-in respite, those type of things. So you're gonna hear more and more across the state about some respite opportunities, which I know is extremely important to all of our families. And the other exciting part of the APA funds are gonna be used to expand our children's autism waiver. I think folks know what an incredible program that is for many individuals and families throughout the state. And with this federal money, we're going to be able to expand the number of kids and families who will use this program. So in summary, we have listened, we have learned, and we have adapted. And this conference is going to be part of that process. DDS is making a cultural commitment to bridge the gaps so we can be a better agency. And we want to hear from you. Individuals and families will always be the backbone of DDS. And family support is such a vital program to the families we support, their ability to keep their loved ones at home and their ability to make sure that their sons and daughters and siblings are seen and heard throughout their communities. The future is bright. The opportunities are unlimited. And together, we're going to make a difference. So please enjoy the conference today. Keep on talking to us. And thank you all very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'd like to introduce our presenters for our morning keynote on cultural humility, um, Beth Bostick and Roxanne Hoke Chandler. Um, Beth is the proud parent of King James, a medically complex young man. Beth is known for her ability to fil facilitate candid conversations about special education, caregiver needs, disability rights, and health care disparities among underrepresented and disfranchised um, populations. Roxanne is a Boston native, um, a mother of two daughters. She speaks at forums on child care, literacy, and health care disparities. She has a passion for working with marginalized and under-resourced po populations. So I'd like to welcome them. One moment, please. There oh, he, was said some... hmm? he said unplug this. Unplug that and put that in. And put that in here. There I think. No. There it is. There it is. Okay. Okay. It's there. See that. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, let me try that again. <laughs> okay, yes, I took the long commute this morning as well, so we're going to try this again, all right? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I can't tell you how excited I am to be amongst people. Yes. Um, well, welcome to Cultural Humility. Uh, Roxanne and I are going to introduce ourselves first, and then we will get started. You ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, and by the way, there are people on Zoom. Just a warning, I move, so you may not see me, but you will hear my voice. Okay. Roxanne, on the other hand, she's the more compliant one. And right. shy. <laughs> Lots of words I'd use to describe you. Not one of them. Okay. All right, so as, um, as uh, Ellen said, my name is Elizabeth Bostick. I go by Beth, and first and foremost, I am the proud parent and humble servant of King James, who was my medically complex child. Um, and at some point, I may start crying. It's OK, OK? Um, I come into this work first because of the fact that when I was a teenager, I had this awesome opportunity to be an exchange student in Ecuador. And as you can imagine, living in a foreign country for a year where you don't speak the language, you don't understand the culture, was world changing for me. It changed my whole perspective on the fact that not everything looks the same 
in every, every part of the world. From there, after I had James, I started working with a number of community-based organizations on various projects that focus specifically on how do we help culturally and linguistically diverse families. And I became a parent leader with a specific niche, particularly in special education advocacy, to support those families. And now, as the assistant director for the Division of Children and Youth with Special Health Needs, which we really need to get a shorter title for that. <laughs> Uh, I work with our team on making sure that the way we do business includes racial equity and family engagement. Roxanne? I'm the shy one, remember that. Yeah, whatever. So <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, I am Roxanne Hope Chandler, the parent of Faith Chandler, and that's what brings me to this work. I had this plan of being the director of human resources one day. That's what I went to school for, and that's what I was doing. And then Faith came, and Faith was born with Down syndrome, autism, and a mood disorder, and that mood disorder is really what challenges me. As I was navigating the system, I realized that I was privileged. And I go around and speak of my privilege. I am now a single parent. I'm black and African-American. You might, you know, they can't guess. In case they couldn't figure that out. No, no. Yeah. And, <laughs> but I have the education, right? And I speak English as my, primary language. In navigating the public school system, the DDS application, I'm sorry, that is tough. And here I am with a master's degree trying to figure it out. I'm like, so what if English wasn't my first language? What if I had to translate this stuff culturally and linguistically? So that was my fire to totally change my career. I worked at the Federation for Children with Special Needs for 14 years. I teach at taught. I'm, I'm slowing down. UMass Boston, Fitchburg State, and a lot of my work has been around professional development. I have to give back, I have to share. Um, disability has always been important to me. Through high school and college, I worked at Mass Rehab Commission. I love the world, and now I am in the world. <laughs> so um, I hope that you enjoy the show that um, Beth is putting on for you, and I'm just here to keep things calm. <laughs> I'll deal with that comment later. I'm sure you will. All right, so our mission today, should you choose to accept it, well, actually, you don't have a choice in the matter, but anyway, is we've already done the welcome. We're going to talk about culture for a minute and make sure that we're all on the same page as to what we mean when we say the word culture. We're then going to talk about cul com cultural competence. English actually is my first language, yes. Um, and then we're going to talk about cultural humility and what the differences are between the two of them. And then we're going to talk about, well, how do you actually take what you've just learned and use it in the day, things that you do from day to day. How does that sound, everybody? All right, you ready? Okay. We have a time limit. So there are no limits. No, no, there's an agenda and we have to be. She said, just do our thing. Go ahead, all right, I'm sure. You know, when they proposed we do this together, I was so excited. <laughs> All right, so many of you have been probably going, I'm trying not to look at my phone right now. Here's your opportunity, okay? So I want you to go to menti.com and type in the code 47202024 and answer the question, what words come to mind when you think of culture? We're going to give you time because this building and the internet, you know how funky it can be, you know. Positive attitude. Positive right? attitude. Sorry, Positive sorry. vibes. Positive vibes. Menti.com. Okay. The code is, I will read it again because it's really surprisingly small up there. 4720204. One more time. 4720204. I feel like we should play the song language. in the background, Mike. Do, 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 Okay, back to singing. Do, 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 do
We didn't even practice that. I know, right? That's That's good. We should take that on the road. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, everyone breathe. It's this is no rush here. I know you're all going, oh my god! (laughs) Any minute moment. A few moments we should. Huh? They just pop up. They should just pop up. Or if they're having difficulty, some people could just yell. Yes. We'll see if. Are people in Menti yet? I just want to get a sense of where you are. Okay. Okay, cool. So the question again is what comes to mind when you think of culture? And if this doesn't work, we can always just shout it out. Or we were hoping for a beautiful word cloud. doesn't seem to be appearing here. Okay, so while you're typing in, and in the interest of time, what are some of the responses you typed in, if you feel comfortable telling us? Just shout them out. What do you think of when you think of culture? Enriching. 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 What else? Love. 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 What else? Food. 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 Yes, ma'am. Tradition. Tradition. Identity. Identity. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> they were like three at the same time. I heard family. What else did I hear? Differences. Differences. Tradition. Tradition. Important. 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 Say Res- that again. Respect. Respect. Connection. Connection. Music. Music. Hand in the back. Family roles. Family roles. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. Scary. 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 Okay. Clothing. Clothing. Yes. Values. Values. Food and diversity. Food and diversity. Religion. Religion. Love. Love. I think there was a hand back there. Pride. 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 Some good ones. Those are good. I like them. So why don't you tell them what our definition of culture is? <laughs> All right. Our <laughs> definition of culture is learned and shared knowledge that specific groups use to generate their behavior and interpret their experience around the world. Culture just isn't race, ethnicity. Like every family has a culture, every group has a culture, every work environment has a culture. Coming from a nonprofit working in the state again, culture shift. Culture Culture applies to racial, ethnic, religious, political, profession, age. There are so many different ways to define culture. And while some aspects remain the same, it's also dynamic and constantly changing. Um, When I think about my own child, I do a lot of childhood things, but now somehow she turned 22. How did that happen? I don't know, because I tried not to. Mm. (laughs) And a whole different culture of adult services, a whole new world. So culture can be defined in so many different ways. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the things that I think about is that you know, you can have a culture where you come from Columbia, from Connecticut, or from Chelmsford, right? Culture shows up in so many different ways, and it means different things to different people. Um, but very often people lean into race and ethnicity, and then if you happen to be from a culture that doesn't have, you know, your family doesn't necessarily celebrate things that are culturally related to a prior country or ethnicity, then that could be very challenging. But the bottom line is, every person ha- comes from some sort of culture. I like to sit with that for a minute, because people sometimes be like, don't sit, no, don't be a little. <laughs> the culture of literal stance, yes. Sometimes people are like, I don't have a culture. I'm like, you're breathing. <laughs> we you all have, have it. But it takes some time for some to dig deep and figure out that culture specifically. And that's when I'm going to move to the next. Boom, looking at our cultures. So many of you might have seen this before. It is the cultural iceberg by Edward Hall, the anthropologist. And it look, has you look at culture and what culture means to you. Now, sometimes. I've practiced this many times, so I'm going to share my cultures. So when you look at me, you might make assumptions that I'm female, and it's true. I have no heavy emotional load with that. I am a female. But I remember saying that out loud maybe about 10 years ago, and I was like, wait a minute, I can't say that. Some people have a heavy emotional load over the sex they were born, right? So we can't make those assumptions. But for me, I'm female and I'm black. And those are things you can look at me and see, right? So they're the top. There's not a heavy emotional load. They're on the surface. 
Then there's the deep culture, which is your behavior, your facial expressions, and your eye contact. I try not to look at Beth in meetings because our faces say, a, yeah, like that. Our faces say a lot, right? So that's our deep culture, our body language. And sometimes you have to like respect this other people's body language. Do you ever see like there's somebody who's talking a lot with their hands and you're like, Ugh. I'm like, it's their, it's their body language. It's part of their personal culture. Or even tone of voice. Yesterday I was having a conversation with some doctors and they were like, I noticed, you know, when I talk, I talk loud, that's my cultural thing, and the family like backs off from it. I was like, exactly, it's culture. And the words we choose as well, too. So for me, that um, deep culture is manners, okay? So manners are really important to me, but I, what are my manners might not be somebody else's manners. Now, when I was in my 20s, I would judge people, because I was raised really strict, and I would look at people who didn't have the same manners as me, and I judge them. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is my personal stuff. This doesn't mean that they're wrong, Oh gosh, this doesn't mean that they're wrong or anything like that, but it's part of my culture around mannerisms that I pass down to my children. Then there's those unspoken rules and unconscious rules, and let me tell you, mine was, and you have to really dig deep, and I challenge you all to think of what your, yours, yours are, but for me it was time, okay? So I would get so stressed out because of people's preconceptions and prejudices around people of color and time. And I realize that other cultures have this too, right? Like around being late and the stereotypes about people being late. So I was so afraid of being judged for being a person. Oh, I see heads nodding. We all feel it. I see you. I feel you. Can I hear an amen? I see it. I see it. <laughs> I was so fearful of being judged around time that I was always an hour early to meetings. The stress that put on Stressful. me, right? Why should I do that to myself? Because I'm afraid of being judged. It was so subconscious, so deep that I didn't even realize it. And the way I found out real quick is that I was training, doing a class, and we were looking at this, and this woman of color came in, and most of the people didn't know that she was a person of color, because, you know, we come in different shades. And she was like, I said, you're supposed to bring something from your culture. She was like, hey, I'm here. I brought CP time, which stands for, oh, child. Color people time. Listen, and I was in front of all these people, and we were the only people of color in there. I said, go ahead. That's what you brought. You explain it, because I'm not, I don't use that term. I'm like, go ahead. Tell them what you brought. She said, Fuck, I'm sorry. I said, don't be sorry. That's yours. But um, so I, I had to stop doing that, right? Because that's what society had done to me. And it got to the point that if I'm a half an hour early, people think something's wrong with me. They're like, what's wrong? Like, I did text you today and say, you know me, I'm at Dunkin'. Because yeah. I don't want people to worry that I'm going to be late. So think about your own cultures, the things you do, your norms, and what people see, what they don't see, and how you might be triggered or offended by something like that. You know, it's interesting. Um, when people see me, they see, I'm sure none of you saw this, a black woman. I don't see it. I'm I sure still can't find it. <laughs> but but I also there's another side of me where I am named Hummingbird because I'm part of the Wampanoag Indian tribe. And so there is a very different culture there where European culture versus native culture and how you actually introduce yourself. So in European culture, you come with your credentials. Mm -hmm. In native culture, you come with your genealogy. So a, I find myself vacillating through different worlds all the time because I have because depending on which group a part of my family I'm with I have to change my behavior because of the social norms that are there that you wouldn't necessarily see but believe me when I tell you if I go into the native culture and start presenting myself with my credentials I have already discredited myself people will not listen to me because of course in the native culture they are not interested in your credentials. Mm -hmm. That's not what's important to them. And in fact, it actually pre pre creates a barrier because they don't trust people with credentials. So when you're interacting with different people, it's really important to, to take the time to learn about things that you can't see. And for that matter, not to make assumptions about what you think you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is another Mentimeter that we're not gonna do that way. We're just gonna shout it out. All right. So when you think about working with culturally and linguistically diverse families, what makes it challenging for you? Language barrier. Language barrier. Sorry? Why. Understanding why. And immigration. Immigration. Family dynamics. Expectations. Expectations. Beliefs. Beliefs. And there was some... Afraid to offend. Lack of personal experience. Lack of personal experience. Economic. Economic. 
disadvantage. Disadvantage, yes. My own bias. Your own bias. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Because <laughs> we all have them. We all have them. Yes. So, any others before we move on? Limitations. limitations. Could you speak more about what do you mean by limitations, if you don't mind I asking? Okay, so the limit around what your expectations are and how you can help and their expectations about how they may even want you to help. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. That's a absolutely. really big one, because let's face it, we're not in this field because we're here to be rich, right? Well, I am. But. Oh, of course. <laughs> but it's like, typically it's because you care about the, about the population, like you want to do this work. And sometimes we have to remember with our caring hearts, we're going into a family and they're like, hey, step back. And you are going and dealing with families all the time, right? So it's like second nature. But every time you walk into the door, it's new. It's, I say this all the time, it's your work, but it's their life. OK. So let's talk about cultural competence. Cultural competence, the definition of it, is the ability to understand, appreciate, and interact with people from cultures or belief systems different from one's own. So what do you notice about that definition when you think about cultural competence? What does it imply? Acceptance. Acceptance. Raising diversity. Raising diversity. Open-mindedness. Respect. Respect. Courage. 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 Lots of that. Yes? Understanding. 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 Curiosity. Curiosity. Willingness to know to know willingness to know that you may not know all the answers and listening. I did get both of those. You're good. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a gift, really. I, know. Yeah. I can't wait to grow up and get it. <laughs> Don't try. Okay. All right. So the thing about cultural competence, the word competence actually implies that you, at some point, learn it all. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand if you know everything about every possible person on the planet. <laughs> uh huh. OK. All righty then. One brave one in the back. We'll talk later. All right. So, but it's very content oriented, right? It, you know, it talks about awareness, it talks about attitude, but there's a real emphasis on knowledge and skills. And so there's a limitation there. I remember when I was um, working with the Opening Doors Project, and this was a long time ago. Um, I was five at the time. <laughs> yeah. um, but they, there was a real thrust for understanding different cultures. And I was actually helping the project to recruit families from different communities so that we could understand how early detection, recreational activity, and moving on to college, what that looked like in different cultures, right? And I remember going to the Institute for Community Inclusion, and they literally had spiral bound notebooks that said everything you need to know about the Vietnamese culture, everything you need to know about the Somali culture. And this is not a criticism. We were doing the best we could at the time, right? But I've met so many people from the Vietnamese culture, and while there are some definite similarities, guess what? There also are some differences. You can't just stereotype a group of people. There's no one monolith, right? Really? So even though you can learn some of the things that are actually, yes, very important when you're going into someone's home or to have a conversation with them, so you have a beginning point for at least establishing there may be some differences in how you kick off the conversation, there really isn't a way to learn everything about every culture and consider yourself competent. Can we all agree on that? Now, again, I'm not saying cultural competence is a bad thing. I'm just saying we shouldn't stop there. Does that make sense? OK. I'm glad we're not stopping there, because it makes me cringe. 
<laughs> it makes me cringe when someone puts their hands up and say they're totally competent. I'm like, oh, that means you're dead and we're talking and I'm a little concerned about that. So we're gonna look at cultural humility, the process of self-reflection. You have to look within yourself and discovery in order to build honest, trustworthy relationships. So it means you're being open. You're committing to be a lifelong learner. You are, as an institution, you're making sure that there's accountability there. You know, you, you, you're passing it down. I really challenge all of you to look, take what you learned today and give it to someone else, because when I'm doing services for my child, I realize who has not been trained. I'm like, oh, so no one told you that. I gotcha. <laughs> uh, empathy and compassion, and to be like really other oriented. And remember that acknowledging the power balance and power and differences is really important on that aspect. Oh, question. Does anybody know why we chose this picture of Michael Jackson? Yes! <laughs> Sorry, I got okay. excited. Man in the Mirror, the song. <laughs> We're looking at Man in the Mirror, right? We have to look at ourselves yep. before we do any of this work. Self-reflection is Self -reflection. key. Self-reflection, a little excited. Sorry. I won't tell you how much we were laughing and giggling when we put that into the PowerPoint. Yes, yes, yes. So some of the tenets of cultural humility as lifelong learning, number one, lifelong learning of others, cultures, self-reflection, and one's own beliefs and cultural identities. Um, in my work around family engagement, people are like, well, how do you know this? I'm like, it's my job to know a little bit about everybody, and if I don't have the answers, I can direct them someplace else, right? If you're going to work with families, it's your job to kind of know stuff. Not too much pressure. So um, we do openness, again, self-reflection, making sure that staying humble in the, your work, right? And part of that is you all are here today. There's other places you could have been, but you decided to come here today, and I thank you and the families of Massachusetts. Thank you. You know, when I think about um, lifelong learning, I, I chuckle to myself, and I think Ann has heard this st story a couple of times. You know, I've been doing a lot of work with a lot of different types of families for years, and I had my first Vietnamese family, and I went in, you know, I was working as, an, as their advocate, went to talk with the family, thought we were all on the same page, Every, you know, we're all in agreement. We go into the meeting. I thought the meeting went well. It seemed to line up with everything we had con talked about. After the meeting, as we're walking through the parking lot, mom loses her nerve. She goes crazy. I'm like, what is happening here? <laughs> I don't understand. And I had gone into this kind of relationship with this attitude of, I work with diverse families all the time. I got this, right? And in that moment, I was like, maybe not so much. <laughs> and so, uh, of course, I had to humble myself, right? And I had to ask a few questions. I'm like, what the heck happened here? And this is when I started learning about when, when someone in the Vietnamese culture says yes, there are actually two different versions of yes, okay? There's yes, I agree with you, which apparently wasn't really what was happening. And there there's yes, I hear you, which didn't mean they were agreeing, they just heard the words you spoke. Uh. And so I started having to ask the question, when you say yes, which version are we going with right now? Because I'd really like to know before we get to the meeting so that we're all on the same page. And you know what, an interesting thing happened when I asked that question. They paused, a couple of them even giggled, and, they, and then they told me the truth, right? And so the other thing that I had to start doing is, is taking on the responsibility of understanding that not only did I have to adjust how I interacted with those families, but it also gave me a clue on how I could empower them because I had to help them to be brave enough to actually be, to be actually tell people what they really thought because they're not socialized that way uh -huh. when they're in, in dealing with people in authority and people in the educational system are people in authority, right? So there was an automatic dynamic that they did not necessarily feel comfortable. You know, we have this history here in the United States where you have to speak up, you have to advocate, you have to let people know how you're feeling. Right? And there are people who come into our country where, uh, no, that does not happen. That is not normal, it is not natural, and it's extremely uncomfortable for them. So they are at a diff very different learning curve. In addition to the language barrier, the cultural barrier, the ridiculous DDS form. I'm sorry, I oh, love oh, you, oh. but really, can we talk about that? Well, mass health is bad, really okay? So, all right, so, but just, you know, <laughs> We're going to get on an advisor. We're great. We're yeah, grateful. We're, great. we're grateful. On. Okay. We're very grateful. So, 
So, but just keep that in mind. You know, as you when you're interacting with families, take the time to dig a little deeper to make mm -hmm. sure that you're actually receiving the information the way that it's intended. So, in ways of doing this is becoming aware of your own cultural norms, as we talked about earlier, and your beliefs and your behaviors, um, identifying and examining your personal bias. Someone mentioned bias. That's great, huge, and sometimes we don't, we have the fear of saying it out loud that we all have bias. And considering the impact and cultural differences might have on your own interactions with BIPOC families. Like, I, um, I think I, oh, I try to do that all the time because I'm human, right? And I say, you know, okay, you're dealing in this situation. You don't want to make assumptions, but remember who you are. Like the example I gave around manners, you know, like some way that I was, and a quick example of that is I talked about how like table manners at the table when you're eating. And I was talking to a coworker and she said, in my family, there were seven kids. If you wanted food quick, you had to just grab it. <laughs> now, if you're sitting at a table of meat and you're grabbing, you're reaching over, like I almost reached over at the coffee station. I was like, oh, I can't do that. You know, so I, if I ate dinner with that family or even with that individual and she reached over my plate, I would have like, oh, so <laughs> But I had to think about and having the context of that. So think about those things. The other thing is, I don't know, oh, this slide is I'm not that talk. bad. That's me. So gaining yes. cultural knowledge. I can't read that. <laughs> do, do you need some assistance? Yes, can you help me? Can you see it better there? I can see it better on my, well, you know what? Let me go stand over here. Okay. So um, Beth is going to read this slide for me because we really thought we could read this and I'll talk, she read. <laughs> All right, so the first one is being comfortable with not knowing, balancing your expert knowledge with being open to learning from the community and their lived experiences. Second one. You want to go yeah, on to the next one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Being curious about other cultures, asking questions, reading own voices, texts about, their other, cult about other cultures, viewing own voices films and documentaries, studying other, another language, attending classes and workshops about other cultures, et cetera. Okay, so I also tell people to Google it. Now, I know Google isn't the thing, but like if there's that one person of color or that one family from a certain culture, they probably get a lot of questions, all right? So just using other ways to get information, go to trainings, go to workshops, read a book, but not always going to that one family, because me and Beth get tired. Yeah, I am so tired of representing so the entire tired. black So tired. So being kept like, on, if you say, sorry, in Massachusetts, if you say Vietnamese support, everybody's like, on, she is not the only Vietnamese person. So just thinking about it that way. Yes. Um, attending cultural events and festivals. Hey, if it's food and music we like, what? you might learn something else. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> Establishing trusting relationships with community confidants or connectors who are able to provide insights into cultural norms, family practices, communication styles, traditions, et cetera. Great term called cultural brokering. So if you're doing work with the Somali community, and you're like, I don't know how to, I don't, well, go to the community, find somebody else who's being active in that community and cultural broker with them. You know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. They already have the relationship there. It's not about you being the one that gives the services, it's about the services being met. Conducting an asset-based community analysis or community walk. Basically, look at the data, right? So I was working with the organization, like we don't have a lot of people of color, different languages coming to get our services. I'm like, well, they don't know about you. So the first thing is to do is to do some information in different languages about who you are and what you're doing. And I was like, and then you have to give it time. You have to cultural broker and do other things because you just showed up one time. They're not going to run to you. You have to establish a relationship go slowly, cultural broker. And sometimes we are impatient people. We're like technology has us on social media, everything's quick, quick, quick. You have to be slow, steady, and just to gain the trust. Yeah, and um, notice the last one said asset-based. You know, in the uh, work that we do, we have a tendency to be looking for what's wrong and how can we fix it, yeah. right? But if we, we need to step back and first of all say, and I learned this in special education advocacy too, What's right? What are some of their strengths? What are some of the things we can leverage? You know, I am constantly blown away by the resilience that is in these families that come from other parts of the world and dive into our world here in the United States and somehow make it work, despite the barriers, right? There are so many things about these families that are positive, and if you continue to look at them as, a, as the problem or the case, 
rather than the individual and the family that has come over so much. And if you take the time to understand their story, it helps you to understand why they're responding to you the way they are, right? So take the time to look at their strengths and resiliencies and really understand that they have their own social capital, they have their own community capital, and they have so much that they can offer and help others with, both inside their communities and outside of their communities. You done? I'm done. Are you sure? I'm positive. Okay. All right. So the next tenet, the second tenet of cultural humility is the recognition of power dynamics and imbalances. But we don't stop there. It's also a desire to fix those power imbalances and develop partnerships with peoples and groups who advocate for others. You know, the power dynamics show up in a lot of different ways. Race, gender, age, disability, social status, education. Someone mentioned um, financial or economic disadvantage. So all of those imbalances take place, and every time each one of us steps into a room with another person, there is a power imbalance that happens automatically, without you even trying, right? And so it's really important for us to be aware of that and to do what we can to really level the playing field when we're talking with people, and then looking at ways that as we are doing things as a group, as we're, doing, as we're developing policies, as we're developing strategies on how we're going to interface with communities, to be very aware of that power and balance and see what we can do to actually lessen that so that we can actually be effective. And Roxanne has an amazing example of that. Yeah. So I am comfortable in saying that I have privilege in certain places. Some people are shocked by it, but you, like you said, there's always a power and balance. So everybody here has has some power in some situation with someone else, right? So being okay and comfortable with that is really important. So I wanted to think of an example that had nothing to do with kind of like why we're here today. And I'm thinking about my other daughter, my so-called typical one I call her, that's not nice, but I know. So she was in high school and I paid for her to go to a private school. Yeah, right, it was ridiculous. So she was in high school and she wrote a paper on what it was like having no people of color working at the school. And like there was nobody. In fact, I did find one person who worked in the kitchen and she friended her on Facebook. I was like, who's a stranger? What's going on? She was like, mom, it's the kitchen lady. I was like, oh, that's so nice, honey. So she wrote a paper about what it was like and the teacher said, you know what? You should bring this to the head of schools. There's gonna be a meeting. You should come and read your paper. And she said, uh-uh, no. And they, these two, and they happen to be white male teachers, and this was an all-woman all -woman school, these two teachers were like, you should come, you should do this, you should do this. And I'm like, wow, they don't even have that relationship with her, but they could understand that she would be afraid to do that to the head of schools and say, this is what's wrong with your organization. I'm a student here trying to graduate. But I teach everybody they should have an ally somewhere, right? All my kids, myself in school, there was always that one person. And there was this one person in the school who was her, happened to be her favorite teacher, and she was an ally before we used the word so much. Mm -hmm. And I called her, I said, listen, they want my daughter to read this paper. She said, they want what? These men. <laughs> Sorry, no, it's, it's nothing to do with their sex. They just don't realize the power imbalance and how she would be intimidated to go to the head of school and say, this is what's wrong here, and please don't fail me out. So this ally teacher went with her and educated the other teachers on why there was a power imbalance that they didn't even realize. But their, the power imbalances are everywhere, as you said. And just think about yourselves and the work that you do. It's not your fault. It's not our fault. That's why when I come in, I present to, like, I do a lot of work with doctors. I'm like, I'm privileged. And they're like, mm -mm, she's in the wrong room. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, keep in mind, particularly for uh, immigrant families or families who haven't been in the United States for a long time, so many of them come from places where special education is not an option, medical services are not an option, and so when they come into the United States, they're just so incredibly grateful yeah. to be here, which is awesome, and we all could learn from that because you know, we all have come to this place where you know, we just assume those things are gonna be there, but the other side of that is that as a result, they may not push back on things that, you know, some of us, it would just go, what do you mean they did that? Exactly. They're like, we're just great. We, we had an appointment. We got to see the specialist, right? 
So keep that in mind, that that, that power imbalance is, exists even in those types of scenarios. So when you're wondering why someone may not be initiating something or engaging with you in the way that you would like them to, mm -hmm. They're looking at you as, I'm just so grateful that you gave me that $750 of flexible spending this year. Thank you very much. I'm not gonna ask for anything else. And you're thinking, but there's so much more that we could offer you, right? But that's that power imbalance again, because as far as they're concerned, they don't push back. They don't ask for more. They're just so grateful for what's here. And that's why relationship is so key. And so, can you imagine how many families just got that little piece of something in education and human service in all these worlds and doctors because back in their country I wouldn't even gotten this but that makes the divide even greater mm -hmm. you know so just think about that in your work pass it on to somebody else teach somebody else so things that you can do to help with the power and balance you know studying the, the history of race in the United States you know so much of that power and balance has been very deliberately and intentionally installed in our systems for hundreds of years. And when people say, yes, but slavery was ended back in the 1800s. And yeah, yeah, that's true. And then so many other things were put in its place to, con to perpetuate the cycles that happened with that. You know, and in the United States, when we talk about black and white, technically speaking, within the governmental systems, often we're talking about anybody who, anyone who's not white is black. When you talk about the fact that Japanese people at one time literally petitioned the Supreme Court to be considered white people because they saw the difference between black and white. Mm -hmm. And that didn't happen that long ago. Mm -hmm. So you have to re really be clear about how history has played out and how that's influencing things today. And again, this is not to beat up on people. This is not for people to feel guilty. It's for you to be aware so that when you're thinking about your interactions with people, you have a different level of understanding as to why they may not trust or why they may be less willing to be vulnerable and tell you all that's going on. Because many people don't trust any form of government. Mm -hmm. So completing a racial equity training and then also learning to develop and evaluate culturally relevant and appropriate programs, materials, and interventions. Um, one of the things that I'm very excited about is there is a much more deliberate and intentional uh, translation of materials. What I'm less, less excited about is that people are trying to find quicker ways to do it and not necessarily uh, effective ways to do it. You know, it's one thing to translate a document and it's word for word. It's another thing to translate a document and it's culturally relevant, mm -hmm. right? When you think about some of the terminology that we use in the United States, let's just, uh, this is one that you, I, I'm stealing from you, okay? Go for it. The, we say IV, right? You translate IV into another language, it means nothing because IV means intravenous. And so that's what we really should be translating, right? You know, when we talk about formula for kids who are G2 fed, that makes sense to us. In other languages, they use the word milk. Right? So you have to make things that are relevant for people, and you have to understand that both translation and interpretation are skills. They're actual skills. And so you, it's really important to find people who have that skill set to make sure that when you're doing that outreach, you don't automatically close the door by having something that somebody can't relate to. You see, when Jaya spoke, she, there were some words that she said in English because in the, they might not have the terms there, mm -hmm. right? So think about like if we were in another country getting, we had a medical emergency and there was a translator who spoke English. We want to know everything. You know how we are. We're from New England, Massachusetts, Boston hospitals. You know culture. We, we get the best health care. So we're there and someone's translating into English, but they are saying things that don't make sense to the English language. Yeah. Translation's near and dear to my heart. I'm a troublemaker, but that's because of my privilege because I can understand English and I wonder about other families who were going through some of the same things I was going through at the same time in their access. So let her breathe. Your turn. Keep going. 
So, and even uh, when you think about interpretation, if you bring an interpreter with you to interface with families, the interpreter really should be somebody who is positioned at the same level as a parent. So if the parent is standing, the interpreter should be standing as well. They're, but they also should be somewhat back because you need to be talking to the parent, not to the interpreter. And so even having, and, and I, I think a lot of people don't understand that the power and balance that even occurs when an interpreter is in the room, right? Mm -hmm. That vulnerability of having to be dependent on somebody else. And often there are times when even the interpreter has their own bias. So the family has to trust that they're not being judged and what they're saying is actually being interpreted and relayed appropriately Ooh. and that they're getting the information back. That's a lot to go through Ooh. in a stressful situation, right? Yeah. yeah. So just recognize, you know, when you're working with interpreters, to take the time, if you can, to, to, to be very intentional about meeting with them beforehand, going over terminology, helping them to understand the intent of the meeting so that you can start to chip away at some of those barriers. Because cultural norms within the community, you have someone who speaks the same language, comes from that culture, but their own biases show up in the room too. Mm -hmm. You know, just because they're the interpreter does not mean that they, that doesn't happen. So be very aware of that. You got anything so that else? I have nothing. I'm sure? looking at the time. Just kidding. I'm having fun. I know, I know, okay. me, too, me too, but I gotta go to work. So the third one <laughs> is institutional accountability. Guys, you're here today, right? People worked really hard to put this program on. Nothing is perfect, but the thing is we're doing change slowly and authentically. Um, sometimes I remind one of my friends, who I'm not gonna say their name, that we're all at different stages of this work. Oh, who was that? On. Oh, it was on. Oh, sorry. Well, all the different <laughs> stages of this work. On and I have done a lot of work together around cultural brokering. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're not there yet. Oh, I know. Oh, we have to, we have to, we have to help and add to them. So, um, the fact is that there are more trainings being offered. Like, watch and see. You know, and I know sometimes we have time constraints, but there are more articles being written. Get, it, get on people's email lists. Find ways to learn things. But we need our organizations to be more accountable um, in the workplace. Right? And, and this is an example of it. Um, through educating, practicing what you preach. So uh, at work, we talk a lot about translation. I'm like, well, gee, I guess we'll have to put that in the budget, right? So that we can pay for translators. So like, it's so easy to say things, but sometimes it's harder to do. And realizing that, again, things take time. The systems we have to work through. But um, link your activities to the why as well, right? So why are we doing this work? You know, why, what is our goal here? The people of Massachusetts, we want to support them. If you want to support the people of Massachusetts, you do that in a diverse way because we all are different. And reviewing services and policies with a cultural lens. Look at who's not at the table. Look at what harm we might be doing. Really some deep thought in some of these actions. So. When we talk about applying a racial equity lens, why don't you talk about the first one? Gee, I wasn't ready for that page yet. Gee. Yes, you are. All right, sorry. That's okay, great. So when we talk about applying a racial equity lens, is one paying attention to race and, race and ethnicity. We clapped. They're now taking the data, right? And some people like, oh, they weren't taking the data in DDS? Well, listen, when COVID hit in DPH, did you see them on the news talking about, oops, we forgot to look at race and who was affected by this? It is a process. We are learning. When you know more, you do more. Okay, so paying attention, that is one great example that was said today that what we didn't know that was gonna be said, we were very excited, we were clapping in the corner mm -hmm. about that. Two is leading with racism explicitly but not exclusively. Race is an issue, right? And we lead it with first, but there's also intersections with race and disability. There's so much more around it. There's language access, ageism, but don't be afraid to look at the race aspect. And as Beth said earlier, sometimes it's like, who's white and who's non-white. Not to lump all together, but like who is not at the table? Look at your community, look at the work. Who is not there? Using a racial equity lens also means analyzing the problem at their root causes, which is why Beth mentioned the history. Looking back at the history and what makes these things happen from a structural standpoint, and also understanding the system is, understanding that systems are the doing and failing. People aren't necessarily doing the failing, okay? It's the system that we need to work at. And almost like when we talk about racism or like the, the term white supremacy culture that gets everybody shaken up, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, it is a system. It isn't the individuals necessarily. Sometimes we just do what we know because that's the way it goes, but we didn't get to look at the whole system of it. 
So think about, I'm gonna move it around, move it back to COVID, right? They didn't think about who was affected most because they didn't ask. They changed that, they worked around that. So think about the systems wide, not the individual. And I always say, you know, don't take it personal, we're talking about the system. And then once you get past that, now make it personal. What can you do to change the system, right? And we all have a part in that. So some of the things that you can think about, you know, there are questions you can be thinking about when you're going out and you're saying, I'm, we're, gonna, we're gonna do this initiative. We're really excited about it. We're gonna change the world. When you're changing the world, make sure you ask these questions. What are some of the racial and ethnic groups affected by this? And what are some of the potential impacts to those groups? Right? Who are some of the people that are gonna be impacted? The other is, does this ignore or worsen existing inequities? And what could be some of the other unintended outcomes. You know, I had a um, situation happen to me a couple of years ago where DPH was doing a study on uh, black women and the experiences they had uh, having children. And so I got a phone call to be a key informant interview. And at first I was like, oh yeah, that would be so cool. I'd love to be able to contribute to that. And then I didn't realize as I was answering questions that I had blocked out some of the horrific things I had experienced giving birth to my two children. It wasn't intended. People were doing the right thing. They were going to the source to get the information. I had to bow out of that because I couldn't handle it at the time. And I remember the person on the other side of the phone when I said that to them, she apologized and she said, we knew that there was a possibility that there could be that unintended consequence. And we're really, I'm really sorry that that happened to you. And I appreciated that. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about working with people and asking questions of them, understand that there may be times where people just will not be able to participate because people have been through horrific, heinous things. And to, have, and to be re-traumatized by recounting that really is problematic. So just be very sensitive to that. I think a good practice with that, but sorry, I know time, sorry, sorry, is to also circle back afterwards. So after, if you ever have a person with lived experience, and I hope you always do, speak and do events, circle back after. Like, how are you? How was that for you? You know, we do pre-work, do post-work as well. Mm -hmm. And then also make sure, have we involved stakeholders from the communities affected by this? I, you know, I think people are getting a little tired of me because I sit and I listen to, we're gonna do family engagement. What are the okay. families? Where are the families at? <laughs> well, we're gonna bring them in later. Later? I thought you wanted them to have input in the process. We do, but we don't know what to ask them. Well, here's an idea. Why don't you ask them what we should ask them? Oh. I'm the good one, guys. <laughs> Right, you know, we say we want families to be partners, but we're also, but there's that power imbalance again, right? Because we are t controlling when we bring them in. Unintended right? consequences. Unintended, yes, right? And how many times have you heard families say to you, well, it seems like you've already decided, so I don't know why you're asking me now, because like, this is what we're gonna do. We'd like to know what you think about it. <laughs> why does it even matter? <laughs> Right? So bringing families in at the beginning of the process, bringing those family partners in, and asking some of the cultural brokers that you have to, where are some of the families we haven't heard from? Because you know, there is a, there's a group of folks, right? Beth, Roxanne, on Jaya. Well, yeah, we'll go to them. We, always, we know those folks, too. Mm -hmm. But there are other folks in our communities who have um, voices as well. And so we need to make sure that we spread the wealth and allow others because I can't represent everybody. I come from a particular set of experiences and others have other experiences. We may all have the same color hue, but that doesn't mean we've had the same experiences. All right. You know, what are some of the barriers to, being more, to having more equitable outcomes? Right, how are we going to, and how are we going to actually address those barriers? How are we going to mitigate those negative outcomes that were identified by that group in the question number one? And then what are we going to do to address the barriers that we've identified in question number four? So here comes one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> the racial equity lens is the methodical uh, sunscreen. When do we apply it, or where do we apply it? Everywhere. Everywhere. When do we apply it? All, All the time. Ways. Racial equity, family engagement, whatever you want to call it, 
It should be the way we do business, not a separate goal or a line item. So we should be doing this in everything that we do. You know, pausing long enough to ask the questions, not only of ourselves in the, you know, the Michael Jackson man in the mirror, but also of the people that we're interacting with and that we very, we have, there's no doubt that we have good intentions. But are you doing the kind of work that's necessary to make sure that your intentions and your efforts are effective? How many times have we had these projects and they're not sustainable or they don't actually launch because something stopped it in the way and we just threw up our hands because there were so many other fires we had to address and we didn't take the time to go back and say, why didn't this work? Mm -hmm. And not take it personally. Again, we're all learning. And it is a system. It's a system, a system. Thing, not individualized. So two things that we need to be conscious of, a learning orientation. We're all constantly learning. Right? It's okay to make a mistake because you learn more from your mistakes than from your achievements. Right? It's the journey along the way. And then the other thing I encourage you to, to be conscious of is what I call change blindness. Mm. We are so entrenched in the system, we can get easily frustrated because it just seems like we're not making any progress. But the fact that we can actually have this conversation today, we're making progress. It's a little change. But if we don't take the time to celebrate the small achievements along the way, we can render ourselves into this learned helplessness where then we give up. But there is so much better. You know, as a person of color, I can tell you there are lots of things I wish that were a whole lot different. But I'm so grateful for the fact that we've gotten as far as we have. The fact that we can have these conversations. Yeah. And that I can do it in a manner where it's safe and I'm not likely to lose my life in the process mm -hmm. in certain circles. Because that's a real It's real for concern. a lot of people. You turn on the news, you see it all the time. Right? So keep that in mind. That's you. No, that has your name on it. But OK, fine, I'll do it. So in summary, our th you know, when we're looking at cultural humility, it's the process of self-reflection and discovery in order to build honest and trustworthy relationships. And the three tenets come down to constant lifelong learning, right? recognition of power dynamics, and institutional accountability. If you do those three things, you're actually changing the word humility to humanity. Right? All of us want to be treated with honor, with respect, with appreciation, with understanding, these are some of the words that came up before when we were talking about culture, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're going to be able to do this, we have to be very intentional about making sure that we're addressing all of these things and allowing ourselves to actually take, us, take, the, take yourself off the hook in terms of having to learn it all right now. Right. Instead, you're partnering with the people you're interacting with. You're learning from them. They're learning from you. And as a result, the competency and the learning continues to grow. And if you do it that way, it's actually a much more exciting journey because you're always learning something new. Right? I'm I've so glad so much. you took that slide. It, I feel so good right now. Does it? Yeah. I'm Thank so you glad. so much. You're welcome. She, wasn't yeah. it good that she did the last slide? <laughs> it's a gift, really. <laughs> All right. So. So we thank you for being here today. We thank you for all the work thank that you're you. doing with families. And we don't wish you good luck. We wish you good effort. Mm -hmm. All right? We want you to do the work. We want you to make sure that your efforts are effective. Right? You can do a lot of things, but if they're not getting the results that you're getting, take the time to look at and ask the question, why? why? The collective intelligence that's in this room is astronomical. So lean into your colleagues, lean into your cultural brokers, take the time to ask questions, be aware of power imbalances, do what you can personally to help dismantle this system and to effectively serve the families that we all love. And thank you for doing so. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.
Thank you both. That was great. That was really great. All right, so it's time for the workshops. Um, and I just want everyone to know you're going to come back here at 12.15 for lunch. And we have um, some entertainment from a young man named Santin. Um, so we'll see you in, well, I don't know what time it is. We'll see you at 12.15.